My name is Sarah Brazel, and I am a program officer at the National Center for Special Education Research at the Institute of Education Sciences. And we're located within the U.S. Department of Education, and we provide research grants. And uh, our National Center for Special Education uh, especially funds research in the area of improving outcomes for students with or at risk for disabilities. And as program officer, I'm over the areas of reading, writing, and language development, math and science, and technology for special education. And I was so excited yesterday when I walked in, I've, saw, I've seen so many of our researchers who are grantees uh, through our programs, people who are developing interventions and um, ex doing some exploration work with data and also developing measures. So it's exciting to see all of you here today. And I get the opportunity to chair this wonderful session on the neurobiological bases and comorbidity of learning disabilities and to introduce to you these uh, four wonderful researchers. And today we're going to be doing the presentations first and holding the questions to the end. We're hoping that you can find some connections also between the presentations when you ask your questions. So as you're listening, please write down any questions that you have so you can remember them at the end. And to begin, we're going to start with Guinevere Eden, who is professor in the Department of Pediatrics and the director of the Center for the Study of Learning at Georgetown University. In the past, she's been scientific co-director for the National Science Foundation-funded Science of Learning Center housed at Gallaudet University, and also president of the International Dyslexia Association. Dr. Eden's primary focus is on the brain bases of reading and how it's impacted by learning disabilities, language, or sensory experiences. And today she's going to be talking to us about brain imaging studies of reading and arithmetic and dyslexia. Good morning. Let me just start by saying how much I've enjoyed this conference and I'd like to thank the organizers, Russ on the team, and thank you for including me. And, um, Today I'm going to be talking about some work that follows on from the presentations that you heard yesterday. Uh, the motivation for these studies uh, really being the fact that uh, reading disability and math disability are very prevalent and uh, that they interfere with learning and particularly uh, STEM related subjects the way uh, was discussed yesterday. Uh, Jack Fletcher gave a beautiful overview yesterday about dyslexia so I don't have to spend much time on this and if you attended his talk you heard him focus on uh, single word reading difficulties and the important role of phonological processing in uh, developing reading skills and how they, uh, uh, in, uh, the fact that children with dyslexia have poor phonemic awareness skills is one of the, the main routes to which they, um, uh, which leads to their difficulty in learning to read. And so if you think of uh, it from this perspective, we know that children with dyslexia have reading difficulties and phonological awareness difficulties. We have a good understanding of the cognitive constructs that underlie these difficulties. And um, my talk is going to be about some of the brain, uh, anatomy and brain function that underlies these skills and how they may be affected. Uh, John Gabriella gave you a, a very nice uh, presentation also yesterday, uh, and he uh, touched on many of the findings that we already have now uh, on brain anatomy and function, and I will focus uh, pr only on fMRI studies, functional MRI uh, data uh, that we use, um, that we gain with this non-invasive technique to try to understand how the brain is organized for reading, how it differs in children and adults with dyslexia, and uh, also how it may relate um, to, to arithmetic. Um, John Gabrielli explained to you yesterday some of the brain areas that are involved in reading. Uh, I'll be touching on some of these same regions, and so just to get you uh, focused onto some of the areas that I, I will be focusing on. Um, we, we heard yesterday from Dr. Gabrielli how uh, the occipital temporal cortex is involved. Um, it's thought primarily for orthographic representation or visual word form recognition. The superior temporal and intraparietal regions are involved. Primarily it's thought for phonological access and also for some semantic uh, processing. And this dual role is also held by the inferior frontal uh, gyrus, uh, which um, also is involved in both of these processes. And the areas that have been primarily of focus in developmental dyslexia are these posterior regions, which seem to be underactivated. And today I'm going to um, talk to you about four studies that we did that asked these questions about uh, how is, how is uh, the, the functional anatomy altered in people who have dyslexia? What happens to those individuals if they are given 
uh, tutoring that is very uh, uh, intensive and uh, very explicit in its instruction. Uh, what does the neural correlate of such a successful intervention look like? And then we move on to arithmetic, um, where we start asking questions about when we do uh, tasks that involve um, reading and arithmetic, do they share any of their brain uh, regions that it, they use? And is it also the case that there is a difference in arithmetic processing in children who have dyslexia, even though they may not be identified as having a, a math problem per se? So turning to the very first question, here's an example of what this kind of study looks like. If you are participating in this particular um, project, uh, you might be lying in the scanner and you would be looking at a crosshair. Sometimes you'd be hearing a word and you would just repeat the word as you heard it. And sometimes you would be asked to repeat the words, but after deleting the very first phoneme. And new words would be coming up all the time. And what we do is um, collect the data and average across all the scans where you were d doing just the uh, simple repetition of the word and then comparing it to the one where you had to take off the first sound and do the phonological manipulation and we subtract these from one another. So the idea here is this cognitive insertion where we're trying to pull out a particular process. So um, a nice way to think about that again is uh, if you scan uh, British brains and German brains and you subtract them from another, you identify the areas in humor, right? So that's one good way of thinking about it. <laughs> so what happens when uh, typical adult readers do this task. Well, you identify the same network that you saw yesterday that's involved in reading, even though they weren't reading directly, they were doing this phonological task. Primarily in the left hemisphere, occipital temporal, parietal, and inferior frontal cortex. And here are our adult uh, dyslexic readers, and you can see here's their activity, and it may look a little bit different to you, to the naked eye, and then if you do a direct statistical comparison, you will see that the adults with dyslexia, even though they could do the task because it was done uh, designed to be deliberately easy for, for them, uh, they still underactivate parietal cortex. And so this is just one example of a study involving phonological processing, but it's very similar to this, when you take a whole range of studies that have been done examining people with dyslexia, comparing them with people who do not have dyslexia, and asking questions, which are the areas that are underactivated? So this is, uh, for example, a meta-analysis that we did some time ago and you see that if you take a range of studies and look at regions that are underactivated in the groups with dyslexia, it really falls to these left hemisphere posterior areas in occipital temporal and parietal cortex. So what happens when you provide an intensive tutoring? Uh, do these areas change? And so it's a very simple question, which is you, you, you scan your participants, uh, you provide the intervention, and then you scan them again, and you look at the differences between those two scans to identify if there is a change. So this is a study that we did some time ago um, in adults who had a lifelong history of dyslexia. These were very special individuals who were seen by June Orton, the wife of Samuel Orton, when they were children uh, in Winston-Salem. And so uh, we knew something about their childhood reading. So these are people who have a lifelong history of reading difficulties. And they flew up from Winston-Salem to Washington, D.C. to be scanned. And then they returned, and during that time that they were back in Winston-Salem, they received uh, a lot of intervention, three hours a day, um, five days a week, over an eight-week period. And um, only half the sample that we had received the intervention. The other group served as a control. They did not receive any intervention at all, so that we could ask the question um, whether they made gains uh, that we could attribute to the intervention. So the adults with dyslexia who received the intervention are in the darker blue bars. And the intervention really focuses on targeting phonemic awareness skills and also visual imagery or symbol imagery. And not surprisingly, after many hours of doing that, those two skills um, improved significantly. But of course, the real question is, do they generalize to reading? And here are two measures of non-word decoding, and you can see that the group, of, the group with dyslexia that received the intervention made significant gains compared to the group uh, with dyslexia that did not receive the intervention. So they did generalize to um, other you know, words where you really had to apply sound correspondence rules. And then here are some other measures of oral reading. Uh, this is real word reading. You see the gain, it didn't meet significance. Uh, there's reading accuracy improvement on the gray oral reading test. The reading rate goes down, which is something I think many of you typically see, which is once 
um, uh, the people with dyslexia begin to understand the rules to sound out words, they, they sound them out more deliberately and more slowly. And then whilst we saw gains in um, answering the questions on the text uh, for the gray oral reading test, uh, the, 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 the in improvement here is not that impressive because it was also seen in the control group. But by and large, what was important here is that we saw gains in phonemic awareness, gains in, in uh, reading of uh, pseudo words, really demonstrating that they um, had made some uh, advancements in these areas. And so now the question is, what do we see in the brain during a phonological processing task? And so what we're looking at next is comparing the brains before and after the intervention, but also between the groups who received the intervention and those that did not, so that we know that the differences from the two days are really attributed to the influence of the intervention. And what we found were um, differences in the left hemisphere, and we had hypothesized that perhaps these left hemisphere regions that are underactivated in dyslexia would now become active. But we also found something that you see in the stroke literature, which is that areas in the contralateral hemisphere now begin to, to move into action. And these are regions that you don't typically see activated during reading or phonological processing, but you do see them in the left hemisphere. And, and so but our results speak for, to a combination of both areas coming online that were previously underactivated, as well as compensation through the right hemisphere. So we concluded from these results that our adults with dyslexia um, not only showed increases in phonemic awareness and other skills that were driven by the intervention, but they generalized to reading real words and pseudo words, and that this increase uh, was, was uh, accompanied by increases in both left and right hemisphere activity. Uh, Dr. Gabrielli mentioned this finding yesterday. We had initially thought that maybe the right hemisphere finding is due to a compensation mechanism that you may just see in adults. These are people in their 40s. The study is now 15 years old. I thought that was old. I don't think that's so old anymore. Um, but uh, uh, the excitement was that you could have these changes in your 40s. But it seems the case that you see the same in children, too. So this seems to be a more general finding in the literature. Um, so moving on uh, from these studies, we, are, we have now started to move into arithmetic. Um, and uh, there's reasons to think why uh, reading and, and some kinds of arithmetic may share some common processes in the brain. So when you look at studies, particularly meta-analyses again, where people look across a range of publications to find which areas are active during reading, here's the uh, meta-analysis by uh, Martin and uh, Richland and others showing the areas that are frequently identified during reading, and you see again the areas that I just talked about, occipital temporal, parietal, and these <coughs> frontal regions that we activate when we're reading. And in arithmetic tasks, you see bilateral activity in parietal cortex, particularly the interparietal sulcus, and frontal activity. Uh, but this um, particular analysis in, involves several kinds of different um, studies. And so what we wanted to focus on uh, was just um, uh, reading uh, arithmetic around um, addition and subtraction. And we wanted to differentiate uh, between these for good reason. So, uh, nothing better than at a conference that focuses on education than to have some audience participation. So um, I ask you to tell me what the answer is, please, to this one. Three plus four is? So you may have noticed it, and I'm sure many of you already are aware of this, but when we do subtraction, it takes us longer to, to solve um, a, a, the arithmetic problem. And this is something that you see in this chart here, where the time uh, to do subtraction is longer than the time to do addition, and of course that uh, takes also longer if they are uh, more complex. But this is an interesting phenomenon, and this is um, interesting when you combine it with the fact that uh, people are also aware how they're doing, how they're solving these particular problems. So when we um, do a, 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 an addition like you just did, we typically just retrieve the answer because we can retrieve it from, from uh, verbal uh, memory. So in this case, 84% um, of people in this study uh, talked about when they solved addition uh, that they would use a retrieval mechanism. But you don't tend to use that retrieval mechanism when you're doing subtraction, where here you see only 31% uh, used retrieval mechanisms to solve a, a, 
a subtraction problem, but they use other uh, kinds of strategies instead. And so what we wanted to do is really focus on both addition and subtraction with the idea that uh, addition involves fact retrieval um, and uh, subtraction involves a more quantitative strategy, strategy such as procedural-based uh, arithmetic. And this, I should notice, is true uh, for small numbers. And so we were using just very small numbers uh, to, to ask this question. So in an fMRI study, what does this look like? So again, our participants would be lying inside the scanner, and this time we're asking them to um, solve these problems and tell us if the answer provided is correct or not. And then you just press a button left or right whether it's correct or not. And we um, asked our participants to look at these small number additions and small number subtractions. And then because we have to have a control condition, this was our control condition where we included these uh, uh, symbolic um, uh, um, representations. And what the participants had to do in this case is just tell us if the symbols on each side uh, were the same or whether they were different. And these are created from original numbers. So the idea here is that here you're, you're doing the actual um, arithmetic operation, and here you're not, but visually you're doing the same thing and you're pressing buttons in your two hands for those two things. Um, we also wanted to look at reading. And a reading task that we have used um, often over the last few years is one that was originally designed by Kathy Price, where again, you see a word, but this time you have to decide, does the word contain a tall letter, yes or no? And if it does, you press one button, and if it doesn't, you press another button. And again, we have people see a lot of words and do that task, and we also have them see these pseudo fonts, which um, are different from words because they don't have phonology, word form, or semantics, but they can still do the task and tell us if there's a tall feature in the word, yes or no. And it turns out that when you subtract these the scans that you derive from these tasks, you identify areas that are involved in reading, much like we did um, many years ago when we looked at reading in beginning readers and children, in older children and adults, where you see the typical neural signature for reading, even though the task is a very simple one where you just have to make a, a decision about a tall feature and whether it's present or not. So we use this task in a group of children and adults, and here they are they're actually combined and you can see that when they're doing the implicit reading task, we activate uh, superior temporal and these inferior frontal regions. And when they're doing the simple small number addition task, we also see parietal and frontal regions. And so it looks like there's some similarity in the areas that are recruited. And it looks uh, quite different from subtraction, which, as expected, is much more bilateral, parietal in, in, its, in, in how it, it uses the brain. And this is a, a slightly more complicated slide, and I've just taken one section here. What I'm showing you here is a, an analysis of variance where we were looking at what these brain areas do that seem to have an effective task. So, for example, for reading in this particular slice, you're looking at a coronal section. Here's our visual, uh, here's our visual word form area, uh, which is responsive to the words, but doesn't seem to be interested in addition or subtraction quite so much. And we see that in subtraction, the right interparietal sulcus, which is what we would assume to be involved in this kind of uh, procedural-based arithmetic, uh, is active, but we see less of a response for addition and for reading, uh, while in the left hemisphere, we see, a uh, we see a response for reading and also for addition, but it doesn't respond to the subtraction task. So this idea that left temporal parietal regions are, more, are not so involved in subtraction, but more involved in reading and addition. So what we learned from this study is that for small number additions, which require a, a fact retrieval, and for reading, we see activity in left superior temporal gyrus, whereas for small number subtraction, which are procedural based, uh, that seems to activate bilateral parietal sulcus, supramarginal gyrus, and also the inferior frontal gyrus. You didn't see all of these in that very last slide, but if you look at the paper, you can see those, and that reading activates the left fusiform uh, gyrus. So we found this uh, to be very interesting because it also fits for the behavioral work, but it, of course it leads to um, hypotheses that can be made about dyslexia where uh, you ask the question, well, because of their reading problems and because of their phonological problems, do they uh, differ in terms of their arithmetic problems, but specifically to those that are retrieval-based? And so that's the last study I want to um, report on. And uh, already yesterday, people touched upon the fact uh, that there's comorbidity between dyslexia and dyscalculia. 
And we already know that phonological awareness skills uh, not only uh, correlate or are predictive of later reading outcome, but they also predict uh, arithmetic. And this was the work by Steve Hecht as part of that large longitudinal study that Rick Wagner and others were involved in. Um, and we also know from brain imaging work that areas that are involved in multiplication, and multiplication sort of behaves like addition, uh, that it's retrieval based, that that also sits in areas in the brain in the left hemisphere that we associate with language processing and with reading. So here's a, a, a slide from the work by Desmet and colleagues showing you that there's a relationship or correlation between uh, the, the accuracy and the time it takes to do a phoneme elision task and uh, your ability to do small number um, addition. Uh, so things that are involved in, in retrieval, solving retrieval-based problems. But you don't see such a correlation if you're using um, uh, the kind of arithmetic that involves procedural problems, so a subtraction task. So this seems to be a very specific relationship. And um, there's also evidence to suggest that children with dyslexia, even though they may appear to be normal on math tasks, show difficulties um, specific to um, the speed of number fact retrieval. Um, and they also don't seem to show the, the operation effect that you typically see in children, uh, which is that you are slower uh, uh, on some arithmetic tasks than others. And it seems that in dyslexia, you don't see that, that, that characteristic difference. So we wanted to test it directly in children with dyslexia. And this is a group of children that we've studied for um, in, in, in many ways. Uh, they are children with dyslexia compared to age match controls. And you'll see that they are lower on real and pseudo word reading uh, compared to the controls. Uh, also, they're lower in phonemic awareness but they uh, do not appear to have a, a problem with calculation looking at a standardized test on the Woodcock-Johnson. And so, um, again, these children uh, participated in the fMRI portion, and they, uh, at different times in the scanner, did the addition task and the subtraction task, and what we found was this. First of all, if you take the children um, and, and you combine uh, across the tasks, so independent of whether they're doing addition and subtraction, uh, the main effect of group uh, showed that all the, the controls tend to activate the left uh, supermarginal gyrus, which you can see here, for both the tasks to a, a greater degree than the children with dyslexia did. So even if you combine across these two types of arithmetic operations, there is a between group difference as a main effect. Then we can also ask questions about the main effect of task, and this sort of goes back to what I showed you earlier in our typical participants, which is that you see in areas in green that seem to be more active in subtraction and areas in blue that are more active uh, during addition, and they're not really particularly surprising, things like um, right uh, parietal regions that show a strong response for subtraction, uh, but not so strong for addition because we think of right parietal being more involved in, in uh, subtraction, and again, left superior temporal gyrus, more active in addition, but not so uh, called on upon for subtraction. But the real question was, what is the group by task interaction? And what we found is that in the right parietal cortex in the sup supermarginal gyrus, children who are typical readers use the right hemisphere to do the subtraction task, as one might expect. But when they're doing addition, you're, you're not engaging that part of the brain. The children with dyslexia, on the other hand, uh, engaged it for subtraction, but to a lesser degree. So, so it wasn't as involved. You can see the activity is lower than in the children who are the control group. But they're also engaging it for addition, which doesn't seem like a very good strategy, because it's not the part of the brain that is really assigned to that task, if you want to think of it in that term. So this really explains um, the kind of behavioral work that was done by Bart Butts and others, suggesting that they are probably using a strategy that is not efficient. They're using a brain process, perhaps because the left hemisphere isn't working, moving it to the right side, but moving it into an area that's not really designed or helpful in doing this task, and therefore not having the benefit of the more uh, time-saving retrieval-based strategy, but shoving it into a part of the brain that really does more of a computational procedural task. So we've learned from this study that children with dyslexia show less activity during arithmetic tasks in the left hemisphere 
and they lack this kind of modulation by operation in the right supermarginal gyrus. And this not only fits with some of the behavioral work that was done, but I think it really shows where brain imaging can uncover things we may not have expected. Uh, we certainly didn't expect it because the, the, the standardized test that we use for arithmetic doesn't di di distinguish between addition and subtraction. So we wouldn't really have known that they um, may differ on, on those two tasks. In fact, we don't because we never got that measure. But going forward, we are um, looking at that more carefully. So I've given you a sense of four research questions that we asked. And so to conclude, um, what we've learned from this is that dyslexia is characterized by underactivity in left temporal parietal and occipital temporal cortices during reading, but now we also know during arithmetic, um, and particularly during uh, retrieval-based arithmetic. And we know that successful reading intervention can result in increases in activity in the left hemisphere, but also in the right hemisphere. And that reading and arithmetic do rely on some common brain areas if the task is one that involves retrieval-based arithmetic for small numbers. And uh, we also know that those areas, uh, when it comes to retrieval-based arithmetic, are used differently in children who have dyslexia. And overall, this sort of fits uh, well with this idea of the neuronal recycling hypothesis, which Jack Fletcher uh, alluded to yesterday. This idea that, of course, these are skills that aren't, don't come to us uh, naturally. We have to reorganize the brain somewhat in, it, in order to do them. And uh, as we learn to read and as we learn to do arithmetic, that process has to take place. And it may be somewhat more difficult for children with dyslexia to shape the brain in those ways. And I want to um, thank my, um, uh, co my colleagues, particularly Tanya Evans, who has been doing a lot of these math studies. Uh, Anna Mateko has just joined our lab to be doing more of these studies. And we have um, a, an ongoing study right now looking at children with both math and reading disabilities that's funded by the NIH. And uh, we are also uh, looking forward to studying a new study funded by the National Science Foundation where we look at children who just have um, math disabilities. Thank you. And next, we have Nancy Jordan, a professor of learning sciences at the University of Delaware. Over the past 20 years, she's been studying children's mathematical learning. And her particular areas of interest are in identifying predictors of mathematics difficulties and disabilities, early number sense screening and interventions, and fraction learning. Her work in these areas have been funded by IES and NICHD. And today, she also is joined by Luke Rinney, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Maryland in the Department of Human Development and Quantitative Methodology. Dr. Rinney's research focuses on the development of arithmetic fluency, including the effects of metacognition, math learning disabilities, and reading fluency. And today, they're going to be presenting on the connections between calculation fluency and reading fluency, findings from a longitudinal study between third to fifth grade students. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and I think our um, study builds really well on the uh, data that uh, Guinevere just presented. I want to thank uh, IES, who has supported this research as a part of the um, Fraction Center or the uh, Center for Improving Learning of Fractions in the Delaware Longitudinal Study. And of course, my uh, former postdoc and colleague, Lou Green Rinney, who has really led the way on this particular study. I'm going to present because it's a fairly fast presentation, but um, you can uh, talk to him if you have any questions about some of the data analysis and some methods and anything else you don't like, you can just uh, talk to him. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> as we've heard, um, there are a number of children who have both math and reading disabilities, and uh, many of these children in primary school show poorer arithmetic skills, at least involving addition and subtraction, than children with MD, math difficulties, who are good readers. But there's more to the story. Uh, MD children are more accurate than MDRD children on untimed exact calculations. But 
you see uh, parity or a uh, few differences between these two MD groups um, when they are required to engage in rapid fact retrieval. And interestingly enough, and this is like a study that goes way back from one of my um, first uh, grants from NICHD, uh, uh, to, um, to whom I'm also very grateful, uh, we, there are a number of children with reading disabilities who do very well on rapid fact retrieval, at least with respect to addition and subtraction. Uh, nevertheless, arithmetic fluency is related to reading fluency. Uh, we see uh, rapid automatized naming and verbal uh, counting uniquely predict both reading fluency and calculation, um, at least in the primary grades. Um, and this is when, we're con when um, the researchers controlled for a range of cognitive and demographic factors. And these data do suggest that reading and arithmetic at least have some partially shared cognitive underpinnings, which uh, Guinevere showed us that the um, neurological studies also support. But We've, in this Guinevere, and as well as the data I just uh, summarized, really has been concerned more with uh, math in the primary grades and with respect to addition and subtraction. Well, what about older students and multiplication? Much as I mentioned, much of the, pri the, the prior research has focused on the early grades. Um, but, you know, multiplication facts, as was pointed out, are probably not learned in the same way as addition and subtraction. Definitely subtraction, but we think probably even addition as well. And if you guys think back of how you learned your multiplication tables versus how you may have learned addition and subtraction combinations, um, you probably recall that multiplication facts are primarily learned through a lot of effortful rote memorization of the tables as opposed to simply a lot of exposure to combinations. And the kind of backup strategies that are used for multiplication, such as in the main one would be repeated addition that kids are taught to use, um, can be much more difficult and less efficient than the backup strategies that children have available to them um, in addition and subtraction. For example, they can count on from an add end or count on from the larger add end. They can use their fingers with the smaller facts and they can engage in decomposition. In fact, in some of our studies, we have found that some kids can do the, this so quickly that it is almost automatic. And of course, there's many more multiplication facts to learn than addition and subtraction combinations, which does then lead to increased reliance on written materials with symbolic representations, which would include things like lists of facts, visual multiplication tables, and of course, we see flashcards a lot. And this is an example of some kind of um, third grade uh, fact practice that children might get. They see a lot of visual information um, that they have to memorize and retrieve quickly. So, is multiplication fluency more dependent on reading fluency uh, than uh, addition and subtraction? Now, slow reading does mean more decay of uh, just read information in working memory, as has been mentioned in some of the previous uh, presentations. And then also, if a child is slow with reading or um, retrieving um, names from visually presented information, it also means fewer rote repetitions of multiplication facts per, time, uh, per unit time. So we hypothesized in this study that uh, reading fluency would predict initial, acquisi initial acquisition and growth of multiplication fluency over time and to a greater extent than it would for uh, addition and subtraction fluency. Which leads us to the present study that I, we're talking about today. To test this hypothesis, we analyzed longitudinal data from the Fraction Center um, for students from three to five years, for third, I'm sorry, third through fifth grade, we had 449 children in total. 
Children were drawn from two large uh, adjacent school districts in Delaware that um, use similar math curricula and um, standards. Starting in fourth grade, for the most part, they adhered to the Common Core state standards in uh, mathematics. The population was diverse ethnically and had a range of SES, but I did want to point out that we oversample low SES children because the purpose of the um, center was to um, focus on children with math learning difficulties. So um, we measured arithmetic fluency and um, reading fluency longitudinally over six time points, so children were assessed twice a year in grades three through five. We used the Wyatt, uh, which is like a one minute uh, test for addition, subtraction, and multiplication fluency, where we got separate scores. The, um, the problems weren't mixed. There was a separate reliable test um, for each type of operation. And then for reading fluency, we, we used a parallel measure, the tower, which is simply a test of word reading fluency. And I think children have 45 seconds to read as many uh, words as they can. So those are really, really easy measures to give over multiple time points. Uh, in terms of data analysis, we did control for a range of cognitive and demographic variables. We looked at um, nonverbal ability, we use the WASI matrix reasoning, which is highly correlated with overall verbal intelligence. Uh, we looked at verbal ability with the PPVT, which is a picture vocabulary test, oral receptive vocabulary, which also has strong correlation with overall verbal intelligence. Working memory was assessed by the working memory test battery for children, which involved um, recalling sequences of digits. Attentive behavior was basically a classroom attention survey. We used the SWAN, where teachers rated uh, children's behavior in math class on a Likert-type scale. And to get a numerical magnitude understanding, we looked at children's number line estimation ability on 0 to 1,000 number lines. And children were, were given a whole number, and they were asked to estimate where that number uh, should be placed on the line. We uh, determined the percentage of absolute error such that we, we calculated the distance from the child's response and where the actual um, magnitude is, such that on this particular test, the lower score means more accurate performance. And then um, we also uh, controlled for age, gender, SES, and English language status. Luke built autoregressive uh, latent trajectory <coughs> models for addition, subtraction, and multiplication fluency. We have talked some about um, uh, latent growth models and some of the other studies, but this model includes both cross-lagged and latent growth models. In the models capture, they're, they're, they're complex, but they're really great because they capture both long-term growth and arithmetic reading fluency and short-term <coughs> cross-leg effect, cross-lagged effects from one point to the next. <laughs> and this, I'm not gonna expect you to read this or interpret it, but I just have it here to show, and Russell said, do not get into the weeds of data analysis. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just, just showing this so you can see what the model was, we can always go back to it, but the, the asterisks are um, significant effects and you can kind of see you know, direct effects and how we controlled for um, the, uh, the cognitive factors and so on. But oh, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna summarize the results right here because I'm running short in time. Um, so we found significant effects of reading fluency on multiplication fluency, but not on addition or subtraction fluency. And the thing that was interesting is there was a direct effect of early third grade fluency on late third grade multiplication fluency. And this is the, the period when children are lear first learning um, multiplication facts. So basically, um, when children come to uh, third grade, children who are more fluent with their reading also are better with um, fact retrieval at the end of third grade, and also they grow more quickly in multiplication fact retrieval between third and fifth grades. Also, number line estimation, acuity, not surprising, predicted um, 
both initial multiplication fluency and growth over time. And this is sort of a unifying structure that allows children to think about mathematics. So basically, if you have a good sense of numerical magnitudes, it makes it easier to learn multiplication facts. But of course, then it's really interesting that we had an effect of reading fluency after controlling for number line estimation, which points to processes, sort of verbal processes associated with rote memorization also are important for children's learning of facts, which is why it may be related to reading. So, and here we're short on time, but basically you can see the um, numbers that are in red and asterisk show the um, significant effects on uh, the multiplication fluency intercept, which is the level of performance, the slope, which is the growth over time. And you can see, um, in addition to the whole number line estimation, we did see some effects of attentive behavior as well as age, such that uh, younger, older children did worse, probably because our sample, our older children in our sample, our kids who started school later may have been retained, and so on. So, in conclusion, um, no, the brain is going off. Um, the results suggest a different, unique mechanism through which um, reading disabilities um, might impede uh, development of multiplication fluency, which could then contribute it to co-occurrence with math difficulties in third grade and beyond. Some things you might not see in the primary grades. There might be these more, like kids with reading disabilities might kind of do pretty well in, in first through third grade in, in math, but then start having more problems. Um, and we kind of want to propose that these children might be helped by non-written representations and rehearsal to support their verbal encoding. That is, when first learning facts, they might do best on practice that emphasizes oral context rather than written context. Of course, math only becomes more dependent on written representations as school progresses. And um, given that this is a fraction center data, um, we know that multiplicative reasoning and, of course, being very fluent with multiplication facts are critical for learning fractions in the intermediate grades so these problems can cascade. Um, even you know, kids with dyslexia, they might not look like they have primary math difficulties, but then these things can happen. Um, and then just finally, it's important to note um, that we didn't study a population of children already diagnosed with um, difficulties or disabilities, and um, more research needs to be conducted in this area. Thank you. Okay, and finally, we have a presentation by Doug Fuchs, who is Professor Nicholas Hobbs Chair in Special Education and Human Development and Professor of Pediatrics at the Vanderbilt Medical School. And um, I get a chance to work a lot with Doug and Lynn Fuchs and just wanted to give a little plug for a project they're working on that's funded by our center um, that actually is looking at uh, intensive interventions that adds an executive functioning component. And for the one that Doug's working on with reading, it adds a working memory component. So there's been some questions and discussions about that the last two days, so definitely see him or follow the work that they're doing um, with, through doing that. Um, thank you, Doug. His presentation today is going to be on can arithmetic fluency training improve word reading outcomes? Do you want this? Don't start uh, the talk. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you need to know, it's not terribly important, but you, I'd like you to know that um, uh, uh, Nancy and I agreed that Guinevere would have <clears throat> a little more time because it was suggested to us that uh, her important work uh, may be a little bit less well known in this room uh, than uh, the work of Nancy and her colleagues and uh, me and my colleagues. So Nancy and I graciously agreed <clears throat> in return for four future draft picks. Um, <laughs> three are mine. Um, okay, so um, I'm taking uh, Russell's uh, uh, suggestion or um, encouragement that um, uh, I um, try to uh, provide uh, some information that will be of interest to advocates and policy people and researchers. I've tried to do that. 
uh, and hopefully I'll accomplish that in uh, 12 minutes, um, starting now. Uh, okay, so um, uh, all of these people uh, contributed mightily to this project. Um, half of them aren't at Vanderbilt anymore. It would take six minutes to explain where they are and why. Um, I want to start by uh, uh, sharing some context. Um, uh, the academic achievement uh, of most students with learning disabilities, including uh, dyslexia, as well as other uh, kids with uh, uh, disabilities, is terrible, is abysmally poor. Um, how come? Uh, here are three, I think, legitimate and important reasons. Number one, for decades, the severity of their learning problems has been greatly underestimated. Two, uh, the effectiveness of inclusion in our schools has been greatly overestimated. <clears throat> and three, there's been an over-reliance on direct explicit instruction. And I'd like to expand a little bit on the last two. Um, uh, these are, this, this figure represents data from two sources. Um, the Office of Special Education Programs data on uh, placement, school placement of, of children uh, uh, with disabilities. Um, and that's the, the blue line represents uh, children in, uh, uh, children uh, six to 11 years of age who are in mainstream classrooms 80% um, of the time or more. Uh, that's this line. And it's for these, uh, for a good number of these dates, okay? So this is the proportion of kids um, who are placed in uh, general classrooms 80% of the time or more. And uh, trend analysis suggests that this, and this is national data, okay, uh, suggests a positive trend. These data are from the NAEP, um, and um, uh, it shows the uh, proportion of students with disabilities um, who are um, at or above proficient. Um, the additional line shows the proportion of students with disabilities uh, at or above basic that is one grade level below, okay? And so um, what you see here is that uh, the achievement data across a good number of years remains relatively flat as the proportion of children ages six to 11 increases. Um, this, is, uh, this is data from, I can't read it. Uh, can you read it? I can't see it from this angle. It's, it should be there, and I, um, Oregon, um, data from, boy, oh boy, uh, North Dakota and Vermont, Washington, D.C. Okay, so the point is that uh, more and more children, generally speaking, are being placed in regular classrooms with um, no effect on the very low and unchanging performance of uh, academic achievement as indexed on the NAEP. Um, the, th the, the other uh, contributing reason, I think, to uh, the fact that we have large numbers of kids who are not achieving as we would like is that, uh, and bear with me here because this is not, as I, as I start this, this is not really what I'm going, what I believe about explicit instruction. Uh, for 30 years, uh, the dominant and generally effective instructional approach for students with learning disabilities has been explicit skills instruction. Um, yet in the last decade or so, there's been between 25 and 35 uh, randomized control trial studies of RTI, and what we find in these studies uh, predictably is between 25 and 40 percent of the study samples being quote unquote unresponsive. <clears throat> um, 
general, I mean, uh, explicit, direct explicit instruction is beneficial, it's helpful, it's a wonderful addition to our armamentarium of what we do with students with disabilities, but it is insufficient. Uh, we need new and validated instructional approaches targeting specific needs of LD subgroups to supplement direct instruction. And one subgroup likely to require such instruction is students with both severe reading uh, and math problems. So uh, uh, Koppinen and her Finnish colleagues uh, in an unpublished longitudinal study found 40% uh, of first through fourth grade students below the 16th percentile uh, in reading were also below the 16th percentile in math. 33% uh, uh, were um, uh, below the 7th percentile. Um, what's um, very unfortunate, of course, is that these comorbid students show especially poor instructional response. And um, to complicate matters, many schools uh, lack staff and expertise and time to provide more than one intervention per student. So what happens is because reading is usually prioritized, many kids um, with, uh, who are comorbid for reading and math don't get math intervention. Um, on the brighter side, uh, research suggests that word reading and math facts performance uh, share similar cognitive processes, um, which interventionists might leverage in developing uh, efficacious interventions. Uh, but there's little experimental work that's been conducted, and what exists uh, is uh, inconsistent about whether early reading performance affects early math performance, vice versa, uh, or both. Um, we obtained reciprocal effects, but early reading was more strongly related to later math than vice versa, and Duncan had found the opposite, or the, uh, yeah, the opposite, the reverse, I should say. Um, so uh, this brings me to um, a randomized control trial that I want to spend a little bit of time talking with you about. Um, um, and I think you'll find interesting, uh, we had 269 first graders who were selected for uh, reading difficulty. These kids were basically at the 10th percentile on several standardized measures. We uh, recruited them uh, in to two cohorts across two years. They were randomly assigned to three conditions. Uh, a word reading intervention alone, I'm going to call that DF, standing for decoding and fluency. Uh, a word reading intervention with arithmetic fluency training, I'm calling that DF plus M, and controls. Uh, the intervention was conducted one-on-one -on -one for 21 weeks uh, for a total of 63 sessions. Importantly, the DF-only group got 30 minutes of instruction, the DF plus math group got 45 minutes of instruction. Uh, fidelity of uh, intervention, uh, implementation intervention was strong across cohorts and years. Um, the reading intervention included um, sight words, grapheme foaming correspondence, and so forth, you know, the general suspects, we tried to do a really good job of that. Uh, the math intervention requires a little bit of explanation. Uh, basic number knowledge information and efficient counting strategies for addition and subtraction were explained to children. Uh, a very important focus, focus was on speeded practice to build direct retrieval of number combinations, know it and count it. So they were, they were strongly encouraged to know the answer. Uh, and, and to provide it as quickly as possible. If they didn't know the answer or if they provided an incorrect response, they were then given a procedure to count um, to provide the correct response. So speed and accuracy was uh, encouraged. Um, the DF plus M, okay, so the reading and the math uh, intervention and the decoding fluency only intervention were both superior to controls now stay with me, and the DF plus math group was superior to DF on word and non-word timed reading at 
post-treatment, as well as a year later in second grade and a year after that in third grade. Um, mediation analysis uh, showed uh, the effect between the DF plus M and the DF only group from grades one to three uh, was partially mediated by improvement in speeded but not non-speeded math performance. Uh, this suggests that arithmetic fluency training can improve word reading. Um, so across, do across domains, procedural strategies for linking arithmetic problem stems with answers and for linking written and phonological representations of words produce repeated correct associations. Um, repeated correct associations, secure representations of arithmetic problems and words in long-term mem memory, maybe through the same underlying brain and cognitive mechanisms that reflect the ease with which students form arbitrary visual verbal associations. This may explain the previously documented relationship between word reading skill and arithmetic facts, both of which reflect the functional integrity of the relevant underlying domain general uh, brain and cognitive systems. Um, this may also explain our present finding that strengthening a domain-specific capacity for forming arbitrary visual verbal associations through uh, fact fluency practice benefits children's capacity to secure representations of words in long-term memory. Alternatively or additionally, arithmetic fluency practice may strengthen one or more domain general cognitive processes that indirectly supports calculation as well as word reading outcomes. Uh, findings suggest the potential of thinking deeply about word reading and arithmetic uh, comorbidity uh, when defined in terms of fluency as we have for increasing understanding about uh, learning disabilities and expanding intervention efficacy uh, and efficiency. <coughs> At least two caveats. Uh, one is, as I mentioned, uh, the treatments were of differing um, duration, uh, <clears throat> and there is an additional need of, um, there's a need of additional competing mediators for word and non-word reading, including domain-specific skills and, <clears throat> and domain-general processes. That's it. And now we have just a few minutes for questions. <coughs> yes, thank you. Doug, on your study, uh, that first 30 minutes, was that of the DF plus M, was that exactly the same as done with the DF group? Yes. Yes. When you were looking at core outcomes for students in gen ed classes, did you look at accommodations or assistive technologies for students with learning disabilities and see how those that kind of students perform? Um, the, the question is whether I, I looked for um, differences in use of technology. <clears throat> Sorry. The, um, the data, the, the figures you're referring to, the figures, those are not my data. Uh, on one of your earlier slides, you were talking, I guess, about the, the poor outcome for students with learning disabilities. <coughs> And, and so I was wondering whether in looking at the core outcomes, whether accommodations were included in making determinations about outcomes. I, ass I assume, I don't know this for a fact, but I assume accommodations of various kinds uh, were made across classrooms. These, these are national data, so thousands and thousands of classrooms. Um, and uh, I can only assume that from 1998 through 2015 in these thousands and thousands of classrooms, accommodations were attempted in varying degrees. Okay, last opportunity for the break. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys very much.